Classic British horror has an unwritten rule. An aristocrat should suffer mightily against the forces of darkness, but it's always the servants who should mop up the blood. No British author understood this better than Dennis Wheatley, servant of the Queen and sworn enemy of the devil. <laughs> letter D is for devil. Interestingly, it's evil with an extra D at the beginning of the word. The background to my Black Magic books, I've got most of my stuff from reading. But also in the 1930s, I managed to get introductions to the famous occultists of the day, people like Alistair Crowley. But I must tell you one thing, that I have never attended an occult ceremony in my life because I regard it as definitely dangerous to get mixed up in that sort of thing. But I can tell a story. Yes, I can tell a story. The height of his popularity, which probably reached peak round about 1960, it is said that he had in print anywhere between 40 and 50 million copies of his books in 27 languages. Some of his books went through literally scores of printings in, in a year. The modern Dennis Wheatley, who is known as Stephen King, would probably have to live another 15 years to really equal that status. Well, here's to it. Thank you. Wheatley's books contained, across their range, a certain recipe, what these days we'd call a formula. The recipe contained flying saucers, Satanists, stocking tops, Nazis, communists, stocking tops, car chases, fist fights, dashing heroes, and stocking tops. I was brought up a terribly strict Catholic, and my mother and the nuns at school would have killed me if they'd known I was shaking hands with the devil, because in their minds, reading weekly was tantamount to risking the pain of mortal sin. A large part of the appeal was this sex. I had never been told anything about sex at all in any way. And here's this man you know, beating women and and um, getting into bed with them and actually having sexual intercourse with them. And this was tremendous stuff, you know? In his waking dreams, there were times when he saw her with the Satanists, her mouth dripping from spilled red wine and her eyes brilliant from the aphrodisiacs they would have given her, reveling with wanton delight in their debaucheries. At others, waging a losing battle to hide her disgust and terror as they forced her to join them in unmentionable obscenities. He is a man of tremendous energy and many interests. He was a wine merchant to kings, has worn the uniform of all three services, and during the Second World War was one of Sir Winston Churchill's staff officers. I genuinely believe that he wrote these books not just to make money and be a successful author, 
There were also sort of morality plays, like some of the films I appeared in many years ago, where good always triumphs over evil. That was very important to him. So it was a means of not just entertaining people, but putting over, I think, a lot of his own beliefs. <laughs> You'll have to go now. What a good name. You fool! I'd rather see you dead than meddling with black magic. There's always tomorrow to bring us a smile. Wheatley portrayed a very black and white existence anyway, and I guess to some extent that fits in with my own lifestyle. I'm a very black and white person. I guess for someone like me, um, yes, I enjoyed the 60s. I enjoyed the excitement of the 60s, the freedom, the liberty. It also took away a lot of security um, and has left people, a lot of people I have seen, including myself, not quite knowing where to fit in in this world. Wheatley, for me, gives a lot of comfort back. He puts the boundaries back. He talks of ages when people knew where they were going and what they were doing. You could say that part of the formula for Wheatley's occult novels, indeed his novels as a whole, was this idea that you could somehow mechanistically confront the forces of chaos and disorder with the forces of order. It's almost militaristic. In fact, it's said that he had a very hardcore following among people who were in the military or ex-military. And it's possible to read his text in that sense. One organizes one's life in order to push back the bounds of darkness. Then, taking five candles, he lit them from an old-fashioned tinderbox and set them upright, one at each apex of the five-pointed star. Rosaries with little golden crucifixes attached were distributed. In their rear, he placed the five brand new horseshoes, which Richard had secured from the village, with their horns pointing outward. He then produced five little silver cups, which he proceeded to fill two thirds full with holy water. These he placed one in each valley of the Pentagon. There was a great appeal uh, to me for the Englishness of his characters. But I think it went further than that, really. It was, um, it was a touch of Great Britain and the Empire. The large houses, the glamorous people, it's the sort of thing that um, I think the lifestyle would have appealed to me very much. They were just ripping good yarns. I mean, that's uh, really the description of the day, I think. Was it ripping? It was uh, old-fashioned, but they were fast-moving narratives. Can we get to the bottom and throw that straight in the face of that damn monstrosity? Right. God help us then. Whoso dwelleth under the defense of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And his characters came out very well. I mean, I, uh, I ended up with a very firm picture in, uh, in my mind, and I still have the same picture of all his characters, who I liked immensely. Very glamorous people, fabulously wealthy. I like that, fabulously wealthy. It's always nice, I think. Not your little gray men, bogged down with mortgages and paying the insurance premiums. They had no troubles like that. In the world of Dennis Wheatley, nowhere else outside these shores really exists. Foreigners should remain foreigners. If they intrude at all into our green little sphere, they tend to do so as villains, as moral degenerates, as the instigators of dark and terrible religions. 
Could you have been so intrigued with the girl that you did not notice the rest of that foul crew? The albino, the man with a hair lip, the Eurasian who only possessed a left arm, the devil worshippers, all of them. Wheatley was very racist, very sexist, very bigoted, I believe, in a lot of his views. I suppose with modern day thinking, I'm able still to read his books, but understand his bigotry. Yet you, a woman, a mere piece of flesh, designed only as a plaything for men, thought you could thwart me. Um, his, um, his attitude towards um, the fair sex, I think, was um, pretty well balanced, really. It certainly fitted into the narrative very well indeed. I mean, there was never a dull man. And if there was a little interlude, there was, um, they were usually up to, I don't know how to put it really, but there's usually some not very nice lady floating about there who they spend half an hour with somewhere. But it was in no way objectionable. It seemed to be a bit of um, understandable relief under the stress under which these chats were working. <laughs> and all the ladies were very beautiful too, which helped, and usually wealthy. My first meeting with Dennis Wheatley really did, as it were, epitomise a clash of cultures. You've got to remember this was 1972. Here was a man of a certain age with slicked back hair wearing his smoking jacket, confronted by someone barely out of his teens with hair long enough to sit on, wearing black from head to foot, Cuban heels and dark glasses. And I do think that there was a moment there when either he was going to throw me out or I was going to leave. And during the next 48 hours, Dennis got through 250 cigarettes, five magnums of champagne, but he produced 20,000 words. The interesting thing is that at that particular time, the odd character was Wheatley, not me, because the tide was going out on him. My tide was coming in. How are things going, sir? Well, Dennis, they couldn't be better. When your two films, The Devil Rides Out and Uncharted Seas, which are being produced by Hammers, are shown, uh, I think that you'll have about 50 film companies after your 50-odd books. Right. No, as far as the company's concerned, the sky is now the limit. That looks familiar. I think, oh, I've, got, I think no, I've, got I've got that, that one. one. Got that check one. it out. Yeah. What, do you know what year it is? No, I don't know. Yeah, no, they're both 1960. Weekly seems to have disappeared from the shops 20 years after, you know, nearly 20 years after his death. Um, he's obviously been overtaken by the modern horror writers. Yeah. And to a large extent, and seems to, seems to be very dated. Although when I read him, I, I find him a very comforting reader. I fully believe in survival after death, so I'm not in the least afraid of death. But naturally, I hope that my death uh, will not be a painful one. What he would have thought about today, well, I'm sure, in a way, it's a very good thing that he is not alive to see what has happened. The total, in my opinion, virtual breakdown of discipline in this country and in many others. Nowadays, if you read the horror writers of today, their horror comes and pervades you. It, it involves you as an individual. You have to feel what, or they, what they want you to feel. Weekly allow that to remain separate. The horror only happened to his characters. It didn't happen to your audio person. It wasn't directed at the reader. Later in my life, I sought thrills to compare with the weekly. Um, I used to drive cars very fast um, and I liked excitement in films, I liked exciting films and I had quite an aggressive outlook on life and it was all part of this seeking to to bring back this, this thrill of, of this excitement that I, I had. Tomorrow we'll follow a thought from a if only she could keep clear of the police she felt that she would be able to reach a Sabbath meeting place in another 45 minutes. A wild, unnatural exaltation drove her on as the blue rolls ate up the miles towards the west.
Among special effects artists, Tom Savini holds a unique place. He's affectionately known as the Wizard of Gore, the man who put splatter on the map. In films like Dawn of the Dead and Friday the 13th, he makes us believe that the carnage is for real. And he should know, he's seen it with his own eyes. <laughs> Horror deals a lot with painful death because that's one of our fears. We, we hate pain. We're afraid of pain. Everyone knows pain, you know? No one knows death. Um, they see other people in death, but they don't know it. They know pain because they've experienced it, and that's what makes you afraid. I've been called the king of splatter, the king of gore. And that's because, um, you know, it has to be real to me, the severed heads or the body parts, whatever. I had to get the same feeling that I had when I saw the real gore in Vietnam as a combat photographer. And I hate when I see a movie and someone dies and they shut their mouth and they make themselves look pretty. Well, you're not pretty when you die. Your jaw hangs slack, you know, your eyes, you know, you might be the... And that's what I try to do in these fake heads that I had. In my mind, what makes a, an effect uh, successful is the fact that it's really an illusion. It's a magic trick. Now here I can, uh, and blood will come out of the knife, you know, and it's like, I'm really, I'm really reacting to this, you know, because, and you relate to it because I'm alive and you're alive, you know, it's a simple thing, it's a simple effect. But it's just a groove cut out of the, the blade. It's real simple and it's, uh, and it's effective. Just like uh, I would do the same thing with my, my hand, like okay, my hand or a throat or a face or a cut throat, I would just uh, use the, a fake knife and, and just, you know, cut it open like that. See, real, real prop, real hand, fake knife. That's the, that's the rule, of course. The blood is being pumped into the razor by this hypodermic syringe that you don't know about. That's an example of a mechanical device fooling you, just like a magician would. Come on, come out of there. Wait 50 minutes, you get cramps. In Day of the Dead, uh, there was a character, Rhodes, and he was a friend of ours, Joe Pilato. This guy's, you know, killing people and, you know, shooting people at random and blowing them away. He has to die gloriously, so we said, let's, let's tear him in half. You know, we had another friend, we tore his head off, you know, we bit people, but let's tear him in half. So how do we get his real face and maybe his real arms, maybe trying to hold on to his lower body, you know, in the effect? And the, the way, of course, is to just use his real head and arms and give him a fake body. So he was actually under the floor like this. It was stuffed with anything we could find from the, the food tables, you know, and, um, and intestines that we had, that we used throughout the whole film, uh, that unfortunately were left in a refrigerator that it was unplugged. And the smell was incredible. Um, we couldn't protect him with anything up his nose, but we sure protected ourselves with respirators. And we filled it with the guts and the chicken livers and, you know, ch shrimp dip, whatever, apple cores, whatever we could find. And, and include it. Oh, we actually, we were pumping blood into this cavity as well, so it was pretty juicy. So the zombies simply tore into the flesh and, and walked away with his lower body, with his legs. His expression of pain was very real because he was getting the stench, but it was even more real afterwards. <laughs> you know, when the camera stopped rolling, then he could really, he looked like he was gonna heave. Pick up a book of classic fairy tales now, and you might be surprised. Did we really grow up on such an unrelieved diet of infanticide, cannibalism, and bestiality? We develop our taste for the dark side very early in life, and some of us, if we're lucky, never lose it. <laughs> I think if you went into a mall and uh, asked a hundred people what the perception of a fairy tale was, it would be like a children's story. And then if you showed them some of the Grimm's fairy tales, uh, they might be a little horrified to see that it's 
probably worse than most of the Friday the 13th movies, you know? So it's like, uh, things aren't always as simple as what they seem. And I think that that's what I like about the fairy tale form, which is that it's not cut and dry. It's open for interpretation. Once upon a time, long, long ago, there lived a rich man who had two children. His little boy was given him by his first wife, who died when the boy was born. So the man married again and had a little girl, born him by his second wife. And when she looked at her own daughter and then looked at the little boy, it pierced her heart to think that he would always stand in the way of her own child. This evil thought took possession of her more and more and made her behave very unkindly to the boy. She would drive him from place to place with her duffings and buffetings so that the poor child went about in fear. The Juniper Tree is an extraordinary violent story. It is therefore somewhat surprising that it formed the nucleus of a storybook for children of a famous collection of fairy tales which the Brothers Grimm collected in the early 19th century. These brothers shared with their fellow romantics a predilection for violence, I suppose, and a deep interest in the dark side of the mind which finds such strong expression in these tales. One day, when the boy came back from school, the wife said to him, My child, will you have an apple? But she gave him a wicked look because the evil thought had come into her head that she would kill him. Come with me, she said. And she lifted the lid of the great big chest where she kept the apples. Take one for yourself, she said. And she smiled at the boy. So the boy bent over the chest. And as he did so, the evil spirit urged her. And crash! Down went the lid and off went the little boy's head. Fairy tales abound in images of horror and dark fantasy. Snow White choking on an apple. Hansel and Gretel kept like animals in a cage. Tom Thumb eaten alive. Clearly, when the uh, Grimm's brothers collected their stories, what they found were stories that were at times pretty crude. They did not mind uh, mentioning bodily functions, sexual uh, activity, and of course, described in some detail, violent acts of committed upon children and upon women. The brothers Grimm were pretty prudish about the sexual aspects of this and about body functions and almost eliminated them entirely. They were less prudish about the violent aspects. They felt that children uh, could take these. Children were not easily frightened. Um, they would not be damaged by this violence at all. The woman was overwhelmed with fear at the thought of what she had done. No one must know I have killed him, she thought. So I will make him into puddings. So she took the little boy and cut him up and made him into puddings and put him in the pot. When the husband came home, the wife gave him a large dish of black pudding and told him that his son had gone away into the country. 
The father was very sad that his son had gone away and not said goodbye. But he went on with his dinner. He asked his wife for more pudding and threw the bones under the table. I, I read a fairy tale nowadays, I don't understand it, but you do understand it on an emotional, visceral level. I think that was the whole purpose of those things, is to, for children, is to help them sort of understand the horrors and complexities of life without really understanding that stuff at that point. When I was six years old, I read The Princess and the Goblin, and images from that novel have never left me since. One in particular has a palace guard seeing a figure peering in at the window, a figure whose head is as round as a ball and with a face that one might have carved on a pumpkin, but a head twice the size it ought to have been for the body. Now, these things stayed with me, particularly in the dark, and peopled my bedroom for nights after I'd read them. It just set my imagination off, and probably that's really where I've come from as a writer ever since. When I was oh, no more than a year old, I suppose, my, my parents became estranged, in fact, probably very shortly after I was born. And before I was more than three or four years old, my parents lived almost totally apart, but in the same house. What this meant was that because I had to side on one parent or the other, that I stayed with my mother, my father became a completely unseen presence in the same house. There was a sense, I suppose, in which all, all that was going on in the house became magnified. I mean, the, 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 not merely the footsteps coming upstairs in the dark, but also the, my, my, my bedroom became a kind of place of, of, of if not exactly terror, certainly of, of fears in the corners. The shadows moved things. The mesh of the fire guard fluttered enlarged on the wall. Sometimes on the edge of sleep, it became a swaying web, and its spinner came sidling down from a corner of the ceiling. Everything was unstable. Walls shifted. My clothes crawled on the back of the chair. Sounds outside, footsteps and laughter, dogs encouraging each other to bark, only emphasized the size of my trap of darkness, how distant everything else was. And it was only years later when I read this story of the chimney to an audience that I realized that clearly what I was writing about was, was my terror of my father, uh, of coming into the room. Indeed, the story actually contains the line that this terrible thing which, which, which invades this young chap's childhood it was in some sense his father. Indeed, it's a kind of projection of his fears about his father which makes this figure monstrous. These kind of symbols i think are basically your subconscious coming out and uh, as a, as an image uh you know inside of a dark castle uh, you could equate to the inside of your mind or something dark inside of you that you don't understand and uh, it's just a way to ex explore without being literal <laughs> fairy tales, we observe certain patterns of plot. One of the simplest patterns is that a hostile force intrudes into an established simple order of things. For example, the family unit intruded upon by the stepmother. That basic pattern is repeated in modern horror fiction. An example would be Stephen King's It, where a small town community is invaded by a very powerful, dangerous force which threatens the whole town. A group of weak individuals, children, manages to conquer and overpower this force. They do it 
by using the virtues of the child in the fairy tale. A bit of cunning, a lot of courage, and an innate goodness which is victorious at the end. Don't worry, child. Although the little boy was cooked and eaten, he didn't die. His sister buried his bones under the juniper tree, and he came back to life as a little bird. But he was determined to have his revenge on his wicked stepmother. He picked up a huge millstone in his beak and flew with it to the cottage, singing, My mother killed me. My father ate me. Kiwit, Kiwit, what a fine bird am I. The juniper tree is such an empowering story because what happens to the boy here is he finds the strength with the help of his real mother to defeat the intruder mother. And he actually kills her so that at the end of the story, it's not only he who is empowered, but the rest of the family. We have restored harmony and we have a stronger child at the end of it. Upon hearing this song, the woman fell to the floor in fear and trouble. And then she sprang up, her hair standing out from her head like flames of fire, and ran out of the cottage. As she crossed the threshold, crash! The bird threw the millstone down on her head and she was crushed to death. There was a huge flame and a great ball of smoke. And there, on exactly the same spot, appeared the little boy. Fictional horror and reality are sometimes dangerously close. God had had his elbow on my neck my whole life just to, you know, like I was being tested to see, you know, how much I could put up with. The cult comic book The Crow was turned into a movie. Its star, Brandon Lee, was shot in a freak accident on set. How many more times will you remember a certain afternoon of your childhood, an afternoon that is so deeply a part of your being that you can't even conceive of your life without it, perhaps four or five times more, perhaps not even that. How many more times will you watch the full moon rise? Perhaps 20, and yet it all seems limitless. Brandon Lee's death was a tragedy born of tragedy. The Crow itself had been inspired by the death of its creator's fiance. When her father called me on the phone from the hospital, I thought it was an incredibly poor joke to tell me. Um, but when he started to cry, I knew it wasn't a joke any longer. A drunk driver came down her street and killed her. You know, I wanted some kind of retribution for it. You know, I, I wanted someone to pay for all this anger and pain I was going through. And uh, that, was, that was essentially where the story of the crow um, came from. It, that, was the, that was the genesis of it. Crow is a love story fueled by a horror story. Um, it concerns the story of Eric and Shelley, who are madly in love, and uh, they're atrociously killed by a, a gang of young thugs. Eric returns from the grave 
have to mete out vengeance against these characters. first heard The Crow, I felt really sad, happy and sad because, you know, I felt like, wow, you know, I'm not the only one that feels this way, you know? I believe we live in an age which, in which we're more aware of what's going on around us if we're young. There are some people who do like to live life in the fast lane and they don't think about their mortality, but I do. Dracula, the mummy, Frankenstein, zombies, the crow. To me, they're tragic heroes in a way because they're trapped in an existence that they have no choice but to be trapped in. He's a Victorian hero in some ways because he's extremely romantic uh, and he's very tragic, but um, his whole style way he chooses to dress and his his look uh, and and, he, and just his a little bit of flirtation with androgyny um, is is very uh, late 20th century um, and very rock and roll and that's another thing that makes him postmodern. He's he's a postmodern zombie. Was I destined to play this role? <sighs> this is the best role that I've had the opportunity to get my hands on in a film. <laughs> you need <a> professional help. <laughs> number of bizarre accidents on the set, of course. There was an electrician who was hurt very badly. Uh, there was a man who, who ran amok on the set at one point. There was another man who was apparently chased by the police into the set. Um, then Brandon was killed. They called me and said there's been an accident on the set and uh, um, Brandon's been shot. And yet everything happens only a certain number of times. I'm not exactly sure how his death um, just kind of resolved all the turmoil in me, um, but it, it just kind of brought it full circle to where I could see everything in perspective. Then you you may you know you may wake up next to your wife or your lover, you know, a, a thousand times, or you only only may wake up to her twenty times. So. You know, think about that every time. Don't take anything for granted. Um, and you know, standing there staring at his gravestone, I realized that. Um, so it's, you know, it was extremely helpful for me. Um, I'm not nearly as angry as I used to be. There's still some in there, but, um, you know, but that's, you know, that's me. If I were given the opportunity after a year of having been dead to come back, who would I want to share it with? Who would I want to see? And the person I would want to see would be my fiance, Eliza, because I'm getting, I'm, I'm engaged, I'm getting married after the film. And the thing about Eric is the one person that he would want to try and share this with isn't there anymore. And that's the tragic element of this character and the haunted element of this character.
More horror from Clive Barker later in the year. And later tonight, more of the chill factor in the company of wolves at a quarter past one.